Good evening. In your Bibles, if you'll turn to 1 John chapter 2. I want to start by reading out our text for tonight, and then we'll have a word of prayer. 1 John chapter 2, uh, we'll be looking at, I'm going to read out verses 1 through 6, and that's where we'll be tonight. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the clarity of it, the, the truth of it. Lord, that there is no errors in your word, there's no contradictions in your word. Where there may be a lack of understanding, Lord, that's because of our feeble minds. So we pray, Father, through your spirit that you would give us clarity, give us understanding, bring about a reliance upon your word in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would continue to impact our lives through your word whether it be in joyful times or in times of trial, um, Lord, that your word would be what we need each day. And we thank you for this time to gather, for all those that are here, for those that may be uh, watching online. Uh, Lord, we ask that uh, our time would be blessed, that you would be honored and glorified uh, through this evening's study. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so last time we looked at, well, we got through verse 1 and the first little bit of verse 2. So again, I'm going to be a little ambitious this night and see if we can get through all the way through verse 6. So uh, don't, don't look at me like that, like I can't do it. <laughs> so that's what we'll be trying to do tonight. Um, but just for a reminder, uh, what we looked at last time, uh, remember that John said he had written what he did to the Christians whom, who, whom he referred to here as his little children, so that they, the Christians, would not sin. So all that he has already written, the things that he will continue to write here, that they will continue to read, are intended so that they will not sin. That's, that's one of his intentions. In other words, so that their new pattern of life in Christ would be to not continue walking in sin like they did before. Uh, he wants them to walk in the light, not in the darkness, because Christians have been taken out of darkness uh, and brought into the light by Christ. So don't deceive yourself and say there's, there's not sin or that you have not sinned or that you are not still a sinner, because doing so is proof that you are not in the faith, that you do not have fellowship with the Father and with the Son or with other believers. To be self-deceived in this way is to be what, what he called a liar. And we read that here again just a minute ago. Not only that, but we make God a liar when we say there is no sin. Instead, confess your sins to the one who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, that's what we saw in, in chapter 1. <clears throat> and this puts a person in fellowship and takes them from walking in darkness to walking in the light, which means your new pattern of life is to be obedient to God's Word. And um, now when a person sins, when a Christian sins, he or she relies on their advocate, right? We talked about that last week. We saw two main points last week in regard to our salvation, Christ as our advocate and Christ as the propitiation. And Christ is our advocate before the Father, because He is the one who is able 
Okay? He can stand in that place because he paid for our sins, past, present, and future. When we sin as Christians, something diff- there's something different. And Paul tells us what that is after he laments his own struggle with ongoing sin in his life. Uh, in Romans 7, he, he talks a lot about his own struggle with sin. But the first part of Romans 8, Romans 8, 1, should be a very familiar verse to us, right? He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, okay? We're, we're no longer condemned, meaning eternally damned, for it, because Christ, our advocate, says, I paid for those sins. I paid for this person. I paid for that person's sins. Not so we can go on sinning freely, but so that we can be free from the fear of death and to live for Christ. If a person claims to be a Christian and says, well, now because my sins are forgiven, I can live any way I want. Well, that would be clear evidence that they are not a Christian. That's what John is making clear here in these, in these verses. We looked at a passage in Hebrews 7 last week and saw why Christ is qualified to be our advocate. And in looking there, we saw that Christ is our permanent high priest. We saw that he always lives to make intercession for us. He fits this role because he's holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He offers himself is another reason he's our advocate. And finally, he is the son appointed and made perfect forever. We looked at all those reasons last week as to why he's qualified to be our advocate. And in short, John points this out and fully sums it up in the, in the title he gives Jesus at the end of verse 1 in, in chapter 2 here. Uh, in, in describing who our advocate with the Father is, John says it is Jesus Christ the righteous. Okay? That, that's such a profound truth. That title, it belongs to no one but Jesus. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Um, And this profound truth is also the same reason for the second main theme we looked at last week. The verses we read there in Hebrews, they're also why Christ is qualified to be our propitiation. Again, meaning appeasement or satisfaction of the righteous anger and wrath of God. And I was thinking this through and this came to my mind... um, thinking about a toddler that's screaming for something and throwing a mad tantrum. And Now, before you get upset, I'm not comparing God to a toddler. I'm not saying God is a toddler, okay? Let's get that out of the way. But just for, just for sake of thinking about this idea of appeasement, um, you know, if you have kids or if you've been around little kids, you know, the, the, they get really upset because they want something and you don't know what it is. And so they're letting out these ear-piercing screams and it just seems like it's getting more and more frantic as you're you're grabbing for things, trying to find out what is it that they want because they're they can't communicate it with you. Okay, so so you're grabbing all these things, you know, the binky, the sippy cup, the toy, the Cheerios, and, and every time you offer them, they're being slapped out of your hand and thrown or thrown off the high chair, only to increase the wrath because none of those things are worthy. And what is it? What what do they want? You know, and then there comes that time where you've apparently you found the thing because you hand it and the crying stops, and it's it's over. You find that thing, you offer that one thing that stops the violence and the wrath, uh, and you have appeased the child's wrath by offering what was required, that one thing. Okay, and again, I realize this analogy breaks down in a lot of places. God is not a toddler. Okay, God's anger and wrath are righteous. There is nothing sinful about God's anger and wrath. It is completely righteous, completely deserved on our part. Uh, He is not out of control. A toddler is out of control. Okay. So don't, I'm not comparing God to those things. Just for the sake of trying to understand that this idea of this one thing, okay? And God is a wrathful and angry God. We talked about that last week. And people are storing up that wrath in their sins. And, and one day, that wrath will be unleashed on a wicked and sinfully depraved world. His wrath is pointed at every single human being. And we offer the the binky of going to church or the sippy cup of self-righteous good works or the toy of proclaiming we did this thing or that thing in the name of Jesus, but it will not stop the coming violence against sin. What is it? What is that one thing? What can appease that wrath? Well, it's only the crushing of His Son, the righteous one. 
the death of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53.10 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to shame. He, God, has put him to shame. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. That is Jesus. That's what can be offered to God. That's how we can stand before God because Christ is our advocate. He is our propitiation. He has satisfied and appeased the wrath of God. We saw last week that this is what John wrote to say to the church, to the Christians he was writing to. Jesus is the propitiation. He is that one thing. We can't offer anything else. You cannot stand before God with anything else. We didn't finish that verse last week, though. That was the first part of verse 2 that we got into. And John makes a point that Christ, as the propitiation goes beyond just those he wrote to at the time, lest they think there's something special, or that God didn't have a wider application for the work of Christ on the cross. Look at that verse there, John, 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, he said, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And this isn't just true of you, he's, as he's writing to these people. This is not just true of you. This appeasement of God's wrath through the blood of Christ is for others as well. In fact, for the whole world. But let's talk about what that doesn't mean. It is a fact that Christ is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. That's what the Bible says. Okay? But wait, does that mean that the whole world is saved? No, we know, we know that's not the case. In fact, most will not be. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Okay, there, there's a condition attached to the application of Christ's work. Another question. When or how is the propitiatory work of Christ applied to a person? What? Okay, at salvation, right? Yeah, when, when a person repents and they trust in Christ alone for salvation, because we are evil, He is righteous. He can be our propitiation. So for the propitiation to be applied to a person's sin account, there is a need for repentance and faith. Okay? And most people will not come to God in this way. Okay? Most people want to be their own God because they love their sin. They love their sin more than Christ. They love darkness rather than light. They won't come to faith in Him. So if Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, but not all are saved, what does John mean when he says the whole world? Okay, well, first, this is... It's a reference to humanity in a general sense, first of all, okay? And more specifically, all people from humanity who come to Christ in saving faith. That's the whole world, okay? It is not the whole world, meaning every single person, because we know the Scripture is clear that many will not be saved. So it's not every single person. He says the whole world, meaning every person that is and will be saved, in other words, the children of God, the people of God, the elect of God, God's beloved saints. Okay, Christians are referred to these different things in Scripture. These are, these are all the ways that the, some of all the ways that the Bible refers to those who are saved. At any given time, among God's people, there are those who are already saved, and there are those who are yet to be saved, but will be. And you probably know some of them, but you wouldn't necessarily know that they're still yet to be saved. Sometimes we don't know. Where do God's elect people come from? The whole world. That's the point here. Not just America, not, not Israel or Africa or Europe or any other specific place. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Right? In Revelation 5.9, John describes Jesus as being worthy to open the scrolls. 
right? He says, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's a fancy way of saying he ransomed people from the whole world. That's where God's people come from, all over the world, all different kinds of people. But they all only come in the same way, through Christ, right? Jesus didn't die to just make salvation possible. We need to understand Jesus accomplished salvation for all who will believe, okay? For all of God's children, Jesus said it is finished, right? The work is done, appeasement made, propitiation made. And the message of the gospel is not that Jesus said, okay, I did my part, now you must do your part. Oh, oh I hope you make the right choice. Okay, that's not, that's not our God. No, he, he did the work and is calling his lost sheep to himself, and they will come. Okay? Not only will they come, but they will also respond in saving faith, and he will never lose any of them. He bought them, and they are his. Christ accomplished salvation. And that's why Paul tells the elders of, the, of Ephesus church to guard themselves and the flock, the church of God. In Acts 20, 28, he says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. He obtained with his own blood. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 10. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. And these words that we'll see here uh, are, are some of the, the best words in Scripture to remind the church of the desire of God for His people and His intention to save them and, and the assurance He will get them and the assurance He can keep them. John 10, looking at verses 25 through 29. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Hey, that, if that's not encouraging to Christians, I don't know what is. That is assurance of salvation. That is a, a direct work of God with a goal, and He accomplishes it. God's not wandering around hoping this will happen and hoping that will happen. He is working. He has done it. And not a drop of Jesus' blood was wasted. Okay? It was absolutely directed at the purchase of his church. Not a potential purchase, but an actual purchase of actual sinners who make up his church. And that's why Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And what? Gave himself up for her. That's what Christ was doing. He died for to purchase his church. So where do those people come from? The whole world. Who are they? I don't know. You don't know. Okay? As, as we benefited from the proclamation of the gospel, you benefited from the proclamation of the gospel at some point in your life. We are to proclaim the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. Okay? It is the means that God uses to call the church to himself. And when they come in repentance and faith, they reap the benefits of Christ as the propitiation, and they come to know Him as Lord and Savior. And John goes on then to show us how to know if we have come to know Him. And honestly, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. It's, it's pretty matter of fact. It induces self-reflection as a, a primary importance. Look at the next verse here as John introduces some new tests of true fellowship with God. 1 John 2, 3. 
And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. First, we need to recognize this verse is not calling on us to start looking around at other people and and pointing our fingers at other people, right? This is about self-examination first and foremost. It's not that this can't be used to, um, you know, look at someone else's life and perhaps wonder if they're saved or not, have that conversation with them maybe. Um, But first and foremost, this is about self-reflection. John is not after the people's self-exaltation here, but he's after their humility. He said, by this, we know that we. He he is including himself in the we. The finger is pointed inward, not outward. He's essentially asking them to ask themselves, do I keep God's commands? Do, Do I keep his commandments? Not do you keep them perfectly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, okay? But are you walking in them? Is it your daily pattern of life to know His commands and to walk in them on purpose? Do you hate it when you fall in this regard? Or does it not bother you in the least when you sin? The idea here is that a person can know for sure. This is an, it's an amazing truth that many of us struggle with believing because of the lie we believe that any single appearance of sin in our life, that's proof I'm not saved. Okay, and that's not what Scripture says. Okay, again, if that was the case, we would lose our salvation every single day, multiple times a day. Paul, was Paul not saved? He was a sinner. What about Peter? Was he not saved? You know, Paul, Paul rebuked him to his face in front of everybody for his sin of hypocrisy. Was, was Peter not saved? Of course not. They, those guys were, were saved. Uh, they hated their sin, but their, their pattern of life was obedience. John is saying that we can know in an ongoing way that we actually have, past tense, come to know God. That is to say that we are saved. And one commentator said, I think something very helpful here, that the word John used, which is translated to the English phrase, have come to know, uh, this word looks back on a past action, savingly believing in Jesus Christ, looks back on a past action that has continuing results in the present. And this is the idea of, of what he's saying here, that we can know. And the word keep here means that a person who's in Christ is guarding the word of God as of most importance in their life. Hey, again, this isn't perfection. If you're putting yourself in a place of, of absolute perfection and sinlessness, that's not what's being talked about here because we can't do that. Is that our goal? Do we strive for Christ-likeness? Yes. But these words are not meant to say, if you fall into sin, you are now not saved, or that's evidence you're not saved. The difference is, what is your pattern of life? How do you walk with Christ or not walk with Christ. Again, this is an intentional belief, a desire, a practice. Um, Look at one of the Psalms that David wrote in Psalm uh, 19, if you'll turn there. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, regarding the word reviving the soul and rejoicing the heart. Uh, and that it's of of greater desire than riches. This is this is the attitude of the person who is obedient to God's commandments. Um, Psalm nineteen verses seven through eleven: The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. That is the desire of the one who's in Christ. That that's what to, to follow God would bring about that kind of devotion that he's writing about there to following the commands of God. Was David perfect? 
No, he's writing that. Did he always follow the commands of God? Absolutely not. He lamented that many times. Yet we know what Scripture says about him. He's a man after God's own heart. So a question. How many Christians say they keep God's commands but fall sometimes? All of them? Yeah. All of them. (laughs) Okay? If they didn't, they would be sinlessly perfect, right? And we're not that. We've already gone over the reality of some ongoing sin in the life of believers. Okay, but Christians have a holy hatred for their sin. They know the, the penalty and the cost of their redemption, which required the agonizing suffering and death of Jesus for their sin. We don't want to sin. That's the attitude of the believer. When we fall to sin, our response is to confess, to repent, to ask forgiveness, and to move forward in, into Christ-likeness, killing that sin in our lives. So another question. This is sort of a trick question. How many Christians say they keep God's commands but continue to walk in darkness as they always have? How many Christians say they keep God's commands but continue to walk in darkness as they always have? Zero. Yeah, none. That's the point. They're, they're not Christians. They can't be. Perhaps they go to church and they have their checkoff lists of the outward shows of spirituality, but there's no heart change. They, they continue in sin without repentance, no desire to follow the commands of God, yet they claim to know Him and try to prove it by doing X, Y, and Z. Look at how the Apostle Paul describes these people to Titus in Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Okay, so John goes on to point this out in his his way here in uh, in the next verse. The next verse gives us a clear answer to that that question. John, first John two four, whoever says I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Okay, here we see the same terms that we saw in chapter 1 he's using here, that, that they're, they're liars. That means it's impossible to make such a claim about fellowship with God and care nothing about being obedient to his word. That's, that's an impossibility. John is asking them to examine themselves. Is this you? When he writes this, when, as they're hearing this or reading this, is this me as I read this? Now, what if a person finds out upon self-examination that they've been a liar, what, that they do not know Christ. It, is it too late? Absolutely not. Right? If a person's still breathing, it's not too late. It, this is a grace of God in their life, that, that they would come to this understanding, perhaps even after spending years and years in the church thinking they're saved, and now they have the opportunity to do what? Be saved. Repent right? Repent and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Spirit of God has revealed this to you, then today is the day of salvation. Do not remain disobedient. As the author of Hebrews says about entering God's rest, here's what he said, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying, through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay, Hebrews 4, 6 and 7. Today is the day, right? When the Spirit reveals to you your sin. Um, I've heard a lot of testimonies from people who, who thought they were saved, been in the church for a long time, and then the Spirit of God convicts them through, of sin and righteousness and judgment. And only then did they truly come to faith in Christ. They had been pretending. But they don't wallow in it. They, they don't say, man, I blew it. I, I missed my chance. I mean, some might, but biblically, if you're still alive, you have not missed your chance. No, they turn to their only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in humble repentance and faith. What a great testimony that is to the grace and mercy of God. 
And what are the commandments? We've been looking at that here. What are the commandments? Well, they're not, certainly not the ceremonial laws of the old covenant, right? That's not what's being talked about here. But, but God's unchanging moral commands and all of the precepts and instructions for Christ-like living that, that our Lord Himself handed down to the apostles and then the apostles wrote down for us in the New Testament, those are His commandments. So what are some examples? What are some examples of those precepts, those instructions from Christ about Christ-like living? Love your neighbor as yourself. To love God, okay? What was that one? Trust in Him with all your heart, okay? What about husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church? What about children, obey your parents? What about bearing with one another, right? Being patient with one another, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us, getting rid of anger and malice and slander and all the other things. Yeah, that's, those are the commandments of God. And there's, there's many others. And Jesus told them to go and make disciples and do what? Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And John continues in the final two verses for tonight. 1 John 2, 5 and 6 says, But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Who's the he? Jesus, right? To the one who is keeping the commandments, here's what you can know. In you, truly, the love of God is perfected. In other words, the genuine love that a believer has for God is perfected. Not perfected meaning it's done or or over with, not that kind of perfected, but that salvation is accomplished. Okay, we can know. And then John goes back to almost repeating the same thing that he started with, giving proof or evidence of true saving faith. He says, by this, by what? Walking in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked. Okay, a person proves they actually abide in him and are not just saying they do. Again, the claim is that one abides in him. That's what a person is claiming, and this means to be in Christ, to remain in Christ, to know Christ. Beyond lip service, a person cannot truly be a Christian without abiding in Christ. It is that abiding relationship which empowers the daily conduct and Christ-like living of the believer. If you are not abiding in Christ, you can't. You can't live a Christ-like life. If one says he abides and does not walk in like manner to the Savior, he's not telling the truth. And again, we we have to differentiate. This is not to say that if a person walks in like manner, they become saved. Okay, We know that's not true. That's not what's being talked about here. These, These things follow salvation. The result of a changed heart of a regenerate person is to walk in obedience to the commands of the Lord, okay? But you can't do it without the Lord. If we abide in Him, the Scripture uh, promises that we will bear much fruit. That's what can be expected from the Christian is bearing much fruit, and that is godly fruit, not just adherence to rules, okay? Um, Look at the words of Jesus as we close this for tonight. Uh, John 15, verses 4 and 5. Listen to what Jesus says here. And, and, and think of it in terms of what we've been looking at here in 1 John. Um, John 15, 4 and 5, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Right, so John's point is that we can know. We can know, but we must examine ourselves by the standard of Scripture regarding what a true follower, a true abider, a true fellowshipper, if that's a word, a, a true walker in the light. We examine it by the Scriptures to see, is that me? Is that what I'm doing so as to not be found a liar? We don't want to be found to be a liar. But if you are upon self-examination, repent. Today is the day of salvation, right? You can still enter that rest. And so again, this, these are tests that John is putting forth here to know first and foremost about yourself. Are you this? Do you obey the commandments of the Lord? Okay, this isn't to start looking around and go, I know that guy doesn't do it. <laughs> okay, um, that's not the goal. Again, that doesn't mean you can't use this in a, in a brother or sister's life to help them with their self-examination, but the point is self-examination, okay? All right, we're out of time for tonight, so let's close in prayer, and then we'll have a time of Q&A for anybody that wants to stick around for that. Um, so let's close. Father in heaven, we thank you again for tonight and for this time to be in your word. Thank you, Lord, for Christ, our advocate. For Christ, the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. We thank you, Lord, that your people, your chosen people, they come from every corner of the earth, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people. Lord, you are building your church from all over the world. We have brothers and sisters in Christ in every town, in every city, in every country, all across the world. There are believers. We thank you, Lord, for your work of building your church, for the blood of Christ that purchased the church. And, Lord, that, that there is no wasted blood, that you don't wonder what's going on, you don't fret, you don't bite your nails. Lord, that Christ has accomplished the work. And you, Lord, however long it takes for the gathering of your church, you are faithful in that. And we thank you, Lord, that when your church is fully gathered, Christ will return to bring us home to be where he is. We're so looking forward to that. And thank you, Lord, for salvation. For anybody that's listening, Lord, that upon examination has found themselves to be a liar, Lord, I pray for conviction through the Holy Spirit of sin and righteousness and judgment. Lord, that they would come to saving faith in Christ through repentance and that they would be by benefit of Christ as the propitiation, the atonement for their sin, that they would be brought into fellowship with you, with the Son, and with other believers. We'll give you praise and glory for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen.